Hi, I'm Jen. I'm Natalie. Welcome to Vodka Culture. Where we drink vodka and talk about culture. It's kind of self-explanatory. Cheers. Cheers. Um, so we want to talk about science. And uh, to begin, Natalie has a story about uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson coming to Minneapolis. Yeah, he's kind of my hero. Now, I will admit, we, we actually recorded this podcast once already, um, almost right after I had actually gone, because it was in June that I went to see his show. Um, so I may be forgetful of things I may have, you know, seen because it was, you know, a couple months ago. But um, I had gone to see Neil deGrasse Tyson. He came to um, the Orpheum in Minneapolis in June, and he is one of my, like, heroes is maybe a strong word, but he is. He's like, I love him. Um, I see him all the time on, like, talk shows or late night shows, and I really, really like him. I would think he was, ac- I would actually say he's probably one of the most popular scientists. Like, he's a oh, cult- he is. culture scientist. Like, right. He, um, he makes science cool. Yeah. Um, you know, like, like, like Bill Nye made science part of the mainstream mm-hmm. dialogue, you know, um, but then Neil deGrasse Tyson made it cool. Mm-hmm. You know, it looks good. Yeah. With Neil. So, um, his show was, um... Go to the movies with Neil deGrasse Tyson. And prior to doing the show, I know the two friends I went with, and I kind of discussed kind of at length what this would be. We had no idea. Was he going to get up and do a lecture? Was he going to talk about the planetarium that he runs? Like, what was this going to be? Um, but it was actually really interesting. Or not but. It was actually really interesting. Um, it was going to the movies. And what he did basically is go through different movies where science was involved and either refute the facts or talk about the facts, bring up the facts, and kind of in a funny way. It was very, very comical. I would say 75% of the show was laughter. It was comedy. It was very, very good. Um, so some of the show, like I said, was refuting facts. He would bring up different movies. One that stuck out was um, Gravity, which he has always said is one of his – is a, is a favorite. It's a good one. But um, I think it's Gravity with Sandra Bullock. Uh-huh. And she's a medical doctor fixing a telescope. <laughs> and he was like, no, you can't do that. I don't go into surgery and, like, do heart surgery. Like, that. Would yeah. not, it's not how it works. It's not like you're a doctor um, and you can do anything in the scientific world. Right, <laughs> right. And, you know, so that was – he said that was really the only kind of fault or plot fault with uh-huh. science in that movie. Um, but some of it was just as silly as um, – the Breakfast Club, and <laughs> <laughs> the nerdy guys, you know, and I'm calling them the nerdy guy because that was the stereotype of him. That's yeah. why I'm saying that. The nerdy guy's dad picked him up in his, um, in a, his the station wagon, in the middle of the wood panel station wagon, and the driver's license was... Um, Eagles so, MC Square. That's what it was. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. I was, <laughs> thank you. No, I, it was like completely at the tip of my tongue. I was blanking. E equals MC Square, So something honey. that everybody would know. Yeah. yeah. So that was on his license plate. Again, he didn't like, you know, refute. He just talked about it. It was kind of fun. Um, he talked about commercials, how they would bring in science, beer commercials. That was his big thing. You know, it's time for a yeah. beer commercial. They always do like explosives or science and stuff. And, yeah. And then there was a French commercial uh, for water. When the woman's job is to go all the way to the sun because it's getting too hot on Earth, and then flicking a, some water from the the French water and it cooled it down or something, and he's like, "Yeah, yeah. she would be dead. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't happen like that, yeah. you know." And just things like that. So it was really yeah. really fun. And my favorite um, Dr. Tyson movie story involved Titanic. Yes, now he talked about that too. Yes. So, and I I heard about this. Um, in a sit down between uh, Stephen Colbert and Dr. Mm-hmm. Tyson, apparently they have a really Colbert and Tyson have a really great relationship mm-hmm. with each other. Um, but yeah, he was talking about how um, the when when Rose uh, Kate Winslet is laying on the whatever it was the, the door. door, staring up at the sky, they got the sky wrong. Mm-hmm. And he's like, "This is a movie that was touted for its." you know, adherence to the science of it or, you know, it's the specificity and recreating mm-hmm. all the actual details. Um, and he's like, but they got the sky wrong. And he went through a long process of like contacting James Cameron yeah. about this. And Cameron was just kind of like, no, well, last I checked, Titanic has made 
$2.5 billion worldwide. Imagine how much more we would have made if I got in the sky right. And so it was such a smackdown. And so Neil was like, uh, you know. We actually ran him to at a gala once, too. Went over to his table. Yes, yeah, that, that was one of the things yeah. was that, yeah, there, there were, more, like, first he wrote a letter and then he ran into him at a, at a gala. Yeah. And then, uh, but then one day Dr. Tyson gets a phone call from somebody who's like, I'm doing... The 2008, the, ten, the 10 year anniversary. Yeah, the 10 year anniversary. I work in the special effects or the, you know, post, whatever it is, department. And uh, Mr. Cameron says that you have a sky we can use. <laughs> right. Yes, and so he's got the right he, sky. Yeah, so in the end, Neil won. Uh, yes, yeah. that was one of the, that was the, like his ending story. I think that's his, a very proud moment for him, I think, that he yeah. had a call to, to do that. So, no, and. It was you were saying you were saying that he is a he has a good relationship with Stephen Colbert, and I think he actually has a pretty good relationship with a lot of the especially late night talk show, talk shows. I mean, that's where I really got into him more because I would see him on like the Real Time with Bill Maher, the Daily Show, or I don't know if he ever went on the Daily Show, but I know the Stephen Colbert show. He would go on and you know J- uh, Leno and Letterman, and he'd go yeah. on these shows and he would talk to them. And it was funny, and it was entertaining, and it was science, which was really cool. Yeah. Um, and usually he's brought, I mean, a lot of stuff can be political, and he's usually brought on a lot of times to be, like, a sounding board for the opposite side of, you know, science stuff. You know? Yeah. Well, you know, and on that point, one of his, you know, big topics that he talks about is climate change and, like, how, like, science is science. It, and facts it's our facts. Yeah. Um, and, and I can't believe that this is still something that's being contested by certain political people. Yeah. yeah. I th- you know, I think some people like to, to play to their constituents versus, you know, leading their constituents, I guess is better, or, you know, doing what they need to do. And they're more, they want to win primaries and they want to win elections. So they, you know, succumb to them or in a few cases, <clears throat> Michelle Bachman, they may just not know. Um, sorry, I don't, I mean, I, it's, I don't just, it's hard it's, to tell with her, but you know, I think some people do. I think, I mean, I think Mitt Romney's really smart. Um, you got, I hear him denying thing, climate change. I hear, you know, politicians do it who I do believe are actually really intelligent human beings. And I go, I, you have to just be doing that to, to win something or lobbyists. Right. Well, I can't, I can't believe that people in general are denying it because I mean, the, the evidence is in, I, I, and I wrote down some stuff here. This is from NASA, which is a, yes, it's a government organization, but it's completely bipartisan. Oh, yeah. um, it's got nothing to do with politics. Um, so um, NASA stated that the heat-trapping nature of carbon dioxide and other gases like um, water vapor, methane, nitrous oxide, uh, chlorofluorocarbons, also called CFCs, um, that this has been demonstrated since the 19th century, that these gases trap heat. Um, their, their ability to affect the transfer of infrared energy through the atmosphere is the basis of many of the instruments that are monitored by NASA or flown by NASA. And uh, NASA states there is no question that increased levels of greenhouse gases must cause the Earth to warm in response. Um, so if you're not quite understanding this, what happens is the, the sun puts heat on the Earth and then the heat comes back and is supposed to, you know, go out of the atmosphere. But we have all these gases that are trapping the heat. The greenhouse effect. Yeah. Yes. All, all these gases that are, that are keeping the heat from going back out through the atmosphere. And, and evidence of this is uh, in uh, the global temperature rise. Like the, the temperatures in the last uh, 20 years are the hottest on record. Uh, warming oceans, declining Arctic sea ice, glacial retreat. Um, and it, it, it increase in extreme events, extreme weather events. So like, you know, hurricanes and tornadoes and, and all that, um, and other natural disasters, decreased snow cover, um, sea level rise. Um, the sea level has risen about, uh, 6.7 inches over the last hundred years, but in the last decade, the rate is nearly double that of the mm-hmm. previous century. It's insane. Um, Antarctica lost uh, 36 cubic miles of ice in a three-year period 
that's a lot yeah, of ice. That's where polar bears live. Yeah. And penguins. <laughs> like. And then also um, ocean uh, acidification. The carbon dioxide absorption is increasing by about 2 billion tons per year. And that's killing fish. You would assume, I mean, if your ocean is becoming more acidic. And I know, you know there might be people who are like, oh, fuck the wildlife. But no, that also affects industry. Like, the fishing industry is a huge global market and and that's also the ecosystem as soon as you mess with the ecosystem it it's like a domino effect Mm -hmm. um and it it that's how you it went again it's a circle of life and when you mess Mm -hmm. up one thing the circle becomes broken and it can't evolve the way it should but i think these these facts you give i think what's important about them is i think once people hear them they get placed in four different groups you're either a person one group who believes all those facts agrees that they're true and agrees that, you know, humans are causing them and needs, we need to do something about it. Camp two is people that agree with those facts. They believe that they're true, but they don't believe that humans are the cause of it. So what can we do about it? Shrug your shoulders, move on. The third camp are people who believe those facts, but don't understand the ramifications of them. And I'll get into that third one in a second. And I think the fourth camp is people who don't believe the facts at all. Yeah. Um, Give me one sec to respond to the um, people who believe the facts but don't believe that humans are responsible. Um, the the most uh, threatening of the greenhouse gases is nitrous oxide, which is produced by soil cultivation practices, especially those involving fertilizer, whether organic or not, fossil fuel combustion, i.e. when we drive our cars, uh, nitric acid production, I don't know what causes that, to be honest, and biomass burning, like burning coal. Yeah. So, I mean, to, to say, exactly. that, it is it is humans that are producing this nitrous oxide that is the, you know, the real threat. Um, yeah. Um, and I think those people are largely, not all, but I think largely are bought off by industries that would be reduced in money if we believed it. Like the coal industry, which is already mm-hmm. kind of dying off, hopefully, um, but, you know, oil companies and so mm-hmm. forth. Okay, so the third camp, I think, is actually one, I mean, that is really important. The camp that um, believes the facts but doesn't understand or doesn't understand the ramifications of them. For example, and this was one of my, somebody once said, and I don't know who it was, and I feel bad I came unprepared, but there was somebody, and I believe it was a member of Congress, stated that, well, yeah, the ice is melt or is melting, but when ice melts in a water glass, this was his actual analogy, when ice melts in a water glass, it doesn't overflow. It just because the volume of the ice will take is taken up by the glass. So as it waters, it's the same amount of it's same. It's just there anyway. So it's not like so. What his statement was: if the ice continues to melt, the oceans won't rise and come over the country because there's all the ice there is already taking up the space. But that's not what's causing the sea level rise. Well, and well, then John Stewart took a bunch of ice cubes and dumped them in a glass and watched the water overflow. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly. Like, but the water yeah, is absolutely. going into the water and pushing it upward. So I mean, yeah. it can be refuted. But those are people who, I, I believe, he legitimately thought that. I don't mm-hmm. think he was saying that to be. Um, I mean, I think that was his actual belief, and that's what he'd been taught to understand was that. That would happen. Um, so I think that's the that's the camp that people we need to get to because I don't know unless we take money out of politics and that's a different conversation with, with camp two. But and then you know camp four they don't believe it anyway. I don't know how many facts we can throw at them before they do believe it. But if there's people there that do believe it and they do understand it, they just don't understand the ramifications, the consequences. Those are the people yeah. that need to be. We need to that need to understand more. Well, you know, Louis C.K. did a bit on this where he was, like, so shocked that, you know, the majority of climate change deniers are Christians. Like, even, like, Bible-believing Christians. And it's like, how could you think that God would give you this earth and not expect you to take care of it? Well, that, and I think, but a lot of them, and I'm saying it from experience, I do have quite a few, you know, few friends that their belief is, and this is their legitimate belief, and I don't want to downplay because it it's what they believe, but they believe that God promised after the flood with Noah's Ark that he would never bring hazard to the earth again. He would never do this to the country again, or the world again. And they're secure enough in their faith that God won't punish them again by destroying the earth. That, okay, Fair point. I mean, I, God's I'm, not going to do I'm it, but, atheist, we're, do, but we're doing it. Exactly. That's, I would yeah. agree with you. Yeah, it's not hundred percent. Yeah, I mean it, this this climate change thing that that's not God punishing us. 
Um, you know, I mean, if, if you're if you're going to su subscribe to that belief, you know, God is keeping his word. He's not destroying the earth. We are destroying yeah. the earth. Yeah. And 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 just and to think that that, you know, God would would give man the earth, you know, man in the in the general sense, you know, people give us the earth uh, and then not expect us to take care of it and just let us like treat it like shit. Like mm -hmm. that's that's ridiculous. Anyway, no, I, I agree. I, I'm I'm in your I'm in head. Oh, when there are you go back to natural disasters, um, certain people find different excuses for it, such as um, gay people. Yeah, the maybe God. if we didn't allow gay people to get married, then we wouldn't have hurricanes. And I don't know where they find the connection in that, but okay. Um, but that so it's easy to say that. And to get people all riled up, I think sometimes that's, and this is why I talk about leadership versus, you know, succumbing to your constituents. Sometimes, you know, we don't live, we're good at tangents, we don't live in a democracy. I know we like to say that. We don't live in a, we don't, we live in a republic. Oh, yep. And our, we vote in people who are supposed to be smarter than we are, more educated, who actually have the time to, to read bills that are hundreds of pages long because mm -hmm. we have jobs and families and things we need to do. We hire people, elect them to do that work for us. And once they read the facts and read in the studies and listen to the scientists, they're supposed to write leg or a vote on legislation that'll combat those issues. So it is their job to say, as much as you want to not believe this is a problem, it is, and we're going to make legislation yeah. happen that will help taper it some. Yeah. And that's what I get really angry at. It's your job to lead. Do it. Yeah, but I mean, like, unfortunately, you know, legislature, le legislators are so busy, and uh, I believe John Oliver did a segment on this too, they spend so much of their time campaigning for money yep. so that they can get reelected, and, and they spend most of their time in office just trying to stay, stay in office. office. Um, and so and imagine, a lot of times legislators aren't even aware of what legislation is. That's why we have lobbyists, so they can sit down and be like, this is what's going on. Um, now, of course, lobbyists are politically skewed as well, yeah. but... Um, or we could take, I mean... But imagine if you yourself, you people listening, if there are any, you go to work every day and you have a job to do and you have things that you know you need to do, but instead you spend six of your eight hours of it at work just trying to keep your job. So you're not actually doing anything. You're just, you're campaigning to your boss on why you're, you're good at your job. You're kissing your boss's ass. You're, you're, you're making everybody feel good about you. You're bringing, making cupcakes to bring to work or you're doing everything you can do to keep your job. And then for two hours out of the day, you you're actually, actually doing your job. job. Yeah. And... It's that's difficult. So I I don't want to place blame solely on these people. The the blame right. the blame I want to fit the do the blame I do want to place on them is not their ability to speak up and at least just say at press conferences or at debates. No, I don't believe that's what it is. How we're going to solve the problem, I will work on in Washington or whatever. But I don't it, come out and say that you know these facts are true, that you know mm -hmm. that this is not made up, that you know that God's not going to fix the problem for us. Have the courage to at least say that, even if you don't know the answers. Yeah. Well, I believe it was uh, Thomas Jefferson. No, no, not Thomas Jefferson. James Madison that wrote this excellent treatise on um, on why America should be a republic. You know, it was a you know in uh, defense of republicanism. Mm -hmm. And mind you, republicanism back in the day. It was totally different oh, yeah. than what it is and now. And a Republican the party yeah. versus a Republican the yeah. way you run your government is right. two different in, things in, too. In the, in the beginning of America, it was like democracy where, you know, everybody has a vote on which everything. Which didn't work. Which doesn't work. Um, look, to, look at California. <laughs> yeah. And um, and so the the argument for republicanism, or uh, for, for being a Republican, republicanism, is that we elect people who are more well-versed than we are, who are more qualified. We at least have the time to get, to spend time doing that. Right. We don't have the time. I don't have time to go and vote every day and, on and every we, piece and of we legislation. And we seek these elder statesmen who, you know, have those qualities where they can make right decisions for us. And we, you know, we, we elect the people that we believe in to represent us. And that is a system of representation. But now... What it's become is it you know what the system has become is just people trying to stay in office by telling their constituents what they want to hear, um, 
And a lot of times what we want to, what, what, what a lot of people want to hear is not the truth. It's not what needs to be said. And it's at the expense of those constituents. I mean, I, I mean, I understand it sounds good to say no more taxes. It sounds good to say, well, that's the big one, but it sounds good to say a lot of things, but they hurt people. If nobody paid any taxes, do you understand that you would not you wouldn't have, have a roads to drive on? You wouldn't have a way. There's some. You wouldn't things, have a military. You wouldn't have a federal drug administration, which is seriously lacking right now. I mean, we wouldn't have things that we need money to control. There are. Money. I'm happy to pay taxes. Um, you know, beyond happy. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. I'm trying to get my paycheck, and I look at them. I go, Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, I want to. I want to. <laughs> like, I, you know, prefer to keep all the money that I earn. Um. Well, speaking in the past. Um. But. Uh, but, but I want a but functioning for, society. For, for, I, yeah, exactly. I want a functioning society. I want my roads to be, I want my roads to exist, and I want them to be in good condition. I want to feel safe by having, a, you know, a, a, a good military force. I, um, I want the FDA to keep crap out of. And what people should be angry about is the fact that, you know, your tax dollars, I mean, there's, there's again, facts. I don't, again, I don't have anything to, to, to source. I will, I know what, I will actually source this and put this on our vodka culture page because I think it's an important source and I don't want to think okay. I'm making it up. But if you look at statistics, the amount of money that somebody that's making $50,000 a year pays in corporate tax loopholes versus anything else is exceedingly high. And I will find that statistic because I've seen it and I will post that because I think that's an important source to not just act like it's true and not back it up. So if you want to be upset about it, be upset about that. But paying taxes for other things is important, and we need to do that, um, I think. But, but going back to saying what people want to hear, you're right. It's fairly easy to say what people want to hear, but it's another thing to keep them alive and keep them safe. Um, the fact that we won't even fund the Zika virus. Um, if there are 17 cases in Florida now, and Congress voted to not the funding that the um, – the nah, National Health Service or whatever requested to fight mm-hmm. it. Um, they offered half of it and then voted it down. Um, and meanwhile, Marco Rubio also put his opinion in that if you're a pregnant woman and you get the Zika virus, you still shouldn't be able to get an abortion. So, but that's, a, again, another podcast. We like to go on tangents. Here. Yes, yes, we do. But the, the job is not to just say, well, I don't want to give, we're not going to increase taxes to fight Zika. You should say, no, this is a virus that can kill people and damage people children mm-hmm. or babies and we're going to do something to combat it whether you want yeah. to or not to save your life yeah i mean science science is definitely something that we should invest in um you know it's been said you know the there are a lot of things that at first glance we're like well what's the purpose of this mm-hmm. the west wing had an episode on this they're talking about the super conducting super collider yes you know um <laughs> was that national block of cheese day it it might it might have been I don't Maybe know there were a few blo- there were a few block of cheese episodes um, my favorite <clears throat> those were so good <laughs> um, but yeah so it was um, it was Sam right that had his um, former phys- physics teacher yes that was not National Block of Cheese Day no yes, there was another was, one with a right guy. so different. so Sam's um, uh, former physics professor. Um, was trying to get the government to fund a superconducting super collider, whatever the fuck it's called. Um, and and Congress was shooting it down because they're like, what's the purpose of this? And he was making the argument that, like, you know, there are so many amazing inventions that we've had that, um, that in the beginning, ostensibly had no purpose. That was really hot. <laughs> um, but then once, once they came functioning, ended up changing, you know, society, uh, having huge impacts. We don't know what, we don't know what the results of our scientific endeavors will be, but we should be doing that because, you know, if nothing else, it furthers our, our knowledge of our universe mm-hmm. and makes us a more well-informed society. And we shouldn't be, com- you know, complacent with stupidity and mediocrity. In ignorance, you know, like we just. So I, I get, I get upset about the the lack of funding for NASA. Um, you can spend my tax dollars on that. That's totally cool with me. Um, the lack of funding for medical research in some areas, like you know, we were saying with the with the Zika virus. Mm-hmm. Um, it, yeah, 
it, it, it's just frustrating because, um, there are people in this country, myself included, I don't want to speak like I'm not, that don't, we, we don't know everything. And that's, we don't know how to combat things. I don't have solutions to a lot of problems. Um, that's why, you know, I, I count on scientists and people to do it to relay facts to certain people that I've elected to a higher office. And I, I have a certain expectation that they will follow through with these things um, and help society and it becomes very frustrating when we don't get that end result and I think that is what has caused such an uprising you know, people eventually are going to be like not acceptable and we have to get there I don't know yeah anyway uh, but hashtag Neil still my hero yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> and you know just just um I'll I'll make a YouTube him now, right now. Stop even listening to us and YouTube yes. Neil right now. Dr. Tyson deserves some YouTube views. Yes, um, I highly, Cosmos, I it. highly recommend um, the the Stephen Colbert, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson sit down. And I can't remember the name of the school, but actually, you know, I'll, I'll post that to the uh, the Vodka Culture Facebook page as well. And he also just had a recent Stephen Colbert interview, just like last week, um, where he found. Wilma from the Flintstones in the moon, and that's kind of interesting oh, to see too. Yes. Like, it's not a man in yeah. the moon; it's a it's Wilma in the moon. Check it out. I just want to um, make one final point or one final suggestion to people who deny science on religious grounds. Um, for me, I find like my proof of God, so to speak, is found in science. That there are these amazing mechanisms and laws, and it, it, that we that we've been able to boil down to equations. Um, there's there's this amazing system at work that accounts for all of life, all of existence. You know, um, and I think that's so beautiful, and and the simplicity in that to have something so complex um, explain so. So it so uh, parsimoniously uh, is really like I find God in that, and that's all the and and I think that um, people who are of faith need to stop feeling threatened by science as saying, oh, because we can account for this with science instead of with faith, that somehow me that's somehow refuting God. It's not refuting God. God is in those equations. God is in. The, the beautiful mechanisms, the orchestrations. It, God is in the atom, you know. It's um, and and not to it. it I do, I do believe in that creative intelligence, um, but I also believe in the Big Bang, you know. I mean, I I find that the Dr. Big Bang is is my you know that that's that's all I need oh, to know about God. Okay, I want to add. Keep going. One, yeah. I, mean, I was going to add one last thing to my last thing was, feel free to comment. Give us, you know, constructive criticism. We are welcome to it. Let us know what you think. Let us, you know, be involved in the conversation with the exception of bullying. We will not take to name calling. We will not take to bullying. Um, I personally won't. Um, I, I would rather have eight people that follow us and watch us that are considerate and nice, even if they have different opinions, than have 100 people screaming and calling us names. Right. That's not going to be accepted. Again, join the conversation. Say your piece. Disagree with us all you want. I enjoy that. I want to learn something, too, and I don't have all the answers, but calling us names will not yeah. be tolerated yeah. we, in any forum. We are game for respectful, um, intelligent debate. So absolutely, feel free to, to disagree with us. Um, frame frame your um, frame your counter argument in a in a in a respectful, intelligent way. Uh, we will absolutely love to engage with you. Please join the discussion. We don't just want to feel like we're speaking into the abyss. No. This is um, and the reason this is a relationship that we have with you and the reason audience. that we've established the way our our country or or this political system work is so that the minority will not be lost in the sounds of the majority. So we want everybody's voice to be heard. Yes. We want you to hear our voice. We want to hear your voice. We just all want to be respectful about it. That's yes. all. So. so until next time, I'm Jen. I'm Natalie. Drink up. Cheers. <laughs>